Good evening. evening. Welcome to worship this evening. A special welcome to any guests or visitors that we have with us today. We also welcome all those who are worshiping with us online, on TV, and over the radio. For those who are listening to us on the radio, I, Pastor Nick Quinette, am conducting the service, and our organist is Mrs. Bethany Babinick. The theme for today's service is the Lord increase our faith, faith that overflows with gratitude. After the service, I invite you all to take these truths we learn from God's word and apply it to your lives. We continue with hearing an anthem. We'll be seeing it up on the screens by the third and fourth graders singing Everybody Praise. Uh, you can find the words in the back part of the bulletin. And after they are done singing, we will, we will sing the opening hymn, hymn number 597, Now Thanks We All Are God.
first service for this, this evening comes from the service setting one in the blue hymnal on page 154. Please note that we are introducing the setting to Lord Have Mercy, which can be found on page 174. And instead of Glory Be to God, we will be singing hymn number 938, This is the Feast. If you follow along with the, with the screens, you will be able to figure out where we are at. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let's confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature, and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trust me in him, I pray. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord.
Grant, O merciful Lord, to your faithful people pardon and peace that they may be cleansed from all their sins and serve you with a quiet mind. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first reading comes from Genesis chapter 8 and will serve as the basis for our sermon this evening. God spoke to Noah. He said, Go out of the ark, you, your wife, your sons, and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing of every sort that is with you. All flesh, including birds, livestock, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, so that they may swarm over the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. Noah went out with his sons, his wife, his sons' wives, along with him. Every animal, every creeping thing, every bird, and whatever swarms on the earth went out of the ship, species by species. Noah built an altar to the Lord and took from every clean animal and every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma. The Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the soil any more because of man, for the thoughts he forms in his heart are evil from from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. The word of the Lord. We continue with the psalm. Psalm 111. Uh, this is actually in the form of a hymn. It's, it's titled, Lord, I Must Praise You.
Our second reading comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Here we see that our gratitude for God's generosity to us will naturally include a willingness to be generous with others. And he who provides seed to the sower and bread for food will provide and multiply your seed for sowing and will increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you may be generous in every way, which produces thanksgiving to God through us. To be sure, the administration of this service is not only making up for what is lacking among the saints, but it is also overflowing in many prayers of thanksgiving to God. By proving yourselves in this service, many people are glorifying God. As they see the obedience shown in your confession of the gospel of Christ, and the generosity shown in your sharing with them and all people. At the same time, as they pray for you, they also express their longing for you because of the extraordinary measure of God's grace given to you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the gospel acclamation and the gospel. Praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, and make known among the nation what he has done. Our gospel lesson for this evening comes from Luke chapter 17. Here we see that ten men had faith that Jesus could save them from their leprosy, yet one man had the bold faith to throw himself at Jesus' feet in gratitude. On another occasion, as Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, he was passing along the border between Samaria and Galilee. When he entered a certain village, ten men with leprosy met him. Standing at a distance, they called out loudly, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priests. As they went away, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. He fell on his face at Jesus' feet, thanking him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus responded, Were not ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give glory to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Get up and go your way. Your faith has saved you. The Gospel of the Lord. You, you may be seated. At this time, we ask everyone to please fill out the white attendance cards that can be found in the pew in front of you. Later on in the service, as the offering baskets are passed, please place these cards in the basket. For all those worshiping with us online, you can also find a link above or below the video. There's also a QR code available up on the screen and in the bulletin. Thank you for your loving cooperation. We continue with the hymn of the day, hymn number 624, Praise to the Lord the Almighty.
grace, mercy, and peace are yours, you who have been richly blessed through our God and Savior. Amen, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. What does Noah have to be thankful for in our reading for today, in our Old Testament lesson? There we find Noah and his family being called off the ark by God to go and enter a world that, well, would have looked very different than when they had gotten on it. If you were in their position, what might be your first thought to do? Maybe you're leaving the ark and you might start thinking, well, I want to go explore this world now as everything has been changed and see what's different, see what it looks like. Or perhaps it's, well, i got to go start building a house and a home for myself. I have to start making this feel like home again after everything has been changed. But what do we see Noah and his family doing? God calls them off the ark and has all the animals come off the ark. And what does he do? He goes in and builds an altar and has a sacrifice, a rather large sacrifice, made to God. We can look over that sacrifice, but maybe we need to take into account of what exactly it was. It says there that he sacrificed one of every clean animal that there was. This perhaps might have been the greatest, the largest sacrifice in, well, percentage-wise that has ever taken place. If you think of it, what had happened, the flood came and God had two of every creature come onto the ark and extras for those clean animals. There weren't a lot to be spared. Not a lot for food, not a lot to go and reproduce, but as they were coming off the ark, Noah took one of every clean animal and sacrificed it to God. It was a great sacrifice, one that really you can say Noah was overflowing with attitude as many animals would have been killed there. But what made Noah so grateful? What did he have so, to be so grateful about? Well, to answer that question, we really have to go back about 120 years, give or take a little bit in there, as the flood was in that amount of time, too. We go back all the way, well, if you're looking through your Bible, to Genesis chapter 6. There in Genesis chapter 6, we see God coming and looking at the world and saying, no, I'm going to send a flood now. I'm going to give the world 120 years to repent, a time of grace here, but then a flood will come. There in Genesis 20, chapter 6, we see the Lord saw that the wickedness of mankind was great on the earth and that all the thoughts and plans they had formed in their hearts were only evil every day. The Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and his heart was filled with sorrow. The Lord said, I will wipe out mankind whom I've created from the face of the earth along with the animals, the creeping things, and the birds of the sky because I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So God said to Noah, I have decreed the end of all flesh because the earth is filled with violence because of them. Now I'm going to destroy them along with the earth. The world had forgotten about God. People chased after their sinful desires. They forgot about the promises of a Savior. They forgot of all the blessings that God had given them. They forgot that God had made them there. They wanted to go and do their own thing. So God, well, he was full of grace still, though. He gave them 120 years to repent. 120 years, Noah would be there building the ark, and every time, every hammer blow that would come down, he would be able to tell everyone, you need to repent because this flood was coming. Many people today might look at the flood and say, see, look at God. Look at God. He is a, a vengeful God. He is a terrible God. What a terrible thing would, what a terrible thing a God would do to destroy this entire earth and all these people if they're missing the fact that god is the almighty god he is the right to bring judgment down and they miss the fact that well for 120 years he gave the people of this earth a chance to repent he gave them his grace can you think of 120 years in the past what it was it's the year 2020 well it had been around 1900 roughly before world war one and world war two even happened it's a long time a long time for these people to come to faith and turn away from their ways, yet, well, they didn't. They didn't, and they kept going down the road to unbelief. But we also see the grace given to Noah and his family here also, where God could have looked at the world and said, look how evil this is. I'm going to start all over. I'm going to destroy it, but 
No, he had grace for Noah and his family as he provided a way for them to survive this, to be delivered from what the life that they were in, really. Can you imagine being the only believers on the face of the earth, how lonely that would have been? The only believers, the only ones who knew that this promise of a Savior was coming. And there, too, we see God's grace. God's grace in preserving this line of a Savior, this promise of a Savior through Noah and his family. God's grace didn't end there after that 120 years were up. No, there was time for the flood to come, and what did God do? God did just as he promised. He had those animals come to Noah and had those one of each male and female come with those extra ones for those clean animals. They all come and came into the ark. Noah and his family went into the ark. And, and what did God do next? The Lord shut Noah in, it says. And there, in that statement, we see God's grace. It wasn't that Noah had to go and shut the door, make sure it was sealed, and said, okay, now I'm on my own for this, this duration of the flood. But God shut him, him, shut him in, giving him that promise that he was going to watch over him. He was going to be with him during this time. It was him who was preserving Noah and his family and all those animals that he was watching over, and he was protecting them. He was blessing them and flooding them with his grace. And then the rains came. For 40 days and for 40 nights, the rains came down from above. They came up from the deep and flooded the earth. Could have been a terrifying time, yet God was with Noah and his family there. And yet that was just the beginning. If you ask people how long the flood was, they usually will say, oh, it was 40 days and 40 nights and it was done. But no, that was just the beginning. If you actually count out the time that the water was on the earth until Noah came out, it was 375 days, just a little bit over a year. Can you imagine being on a ship that size with all those animals for a year, not really, not being able to go outside, just being stuck in there? That God provided for Noah and his family and those animals, making sure that they survived, making sure that they had what they needed. And finally, we come to our lesson for today where Noah was called out of the ark. We can see that Noah and his family had a lot to be thankful for, didn't they? God was full of grace, which filled Noah and his family there with gratitude. Gratitude that God had done so much for them. As he perver persevered them through something, a disaster, you could say, that this earth has never seen before and has never seen since. God was protecting them physically, but also spiritually, too. As he freed them... From those temptations of those other people who are around who are maybe lead, trying to lead them away from God and that promise of a Savior. And, well, he preserved that promise of a Savior for, through them. You can imagine how ecstatic and how grateful they were. Can you imagine now, maybe you can think back to, well, just last week we had that hurricane that hit Florida. And maybe you saw some video of somebody being saved from their home. After being stuck there for days or for being saved from the flooding, how grateful and ecstatic they were that somebody came to save them. How much more for Noah and his family as God saved them physically and spiritually there through the flood. You can see why he offered such a great and wonderful blessing to God. But even after all that, even after God, Noah offered that blessing there, that, or Noah offered that sacrifice there, God continued to bless Noah. We see that in the promise that he gives them. Noah, God smelled that aroma and it was pleasing to the Lord. And then he, he says to himself a promise, a promise that later on he tells to Noah and he seals it with a rainbow in the sky, that one that is a promise for you and me today also. We see in our lesson for today that he says, I will never again curse the soil anymore because of man. For the thoughts he forms in his heart are evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. This is an interesting promise he gives Noah and you and I. It's interesting because that middle phrase that's in there that we can so easily look over. I'll read that for you again. For the thoughts he forms in his heart are evil from his youth. This is 
the phrase as he's describing Noah and his family, believers. And if you think back all the way to what I read there in in chapter 6, it's almost identical to the reason why God came and destroyed this entire earth. I'll read that section again. It says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of mankind was great on the earth, and that all the thoughts and the plans they formed in their hearts were only evil every day. What we see here is God's grace, God's love, and God's blessing for Noah's family and for you and me. Because he made this promise after the flood, knowing that humankind's going to go back and do exactly what they did before. We see, really, nothing had changed, had it? There were still human, sinful human beings that very long after this, they're going to start following away, rebelling against the God, following after their sinful flesh, and for many, losing that promise of a Savior. If you read along in Genesis, you see that this happens very quickly with Noah and his sons, and we can go fast forward ahead all the way to the Tower of Babel, where God has to confuse the languages to get them to spread out to do what he told them to do. That carried on all the way today. That we see our lives, we realize that as we're born in this world, we're born in this world as sinners, aren't we? That our sinful nature is still sinful, it's evil. All the thoughts and desires of our sinful nature are evil all the time, just like the people before the flood were. If you want to get specific with the sins that we have, we can, that apply to this section, we can say, well, one of those specific sins is our lack of gratefulness towards God. Where it's easy for us to look at everything that we have and say, well, this isn't quite enough. That we're not as thankful as we should be for all the blessings that God gives you and me. It can come from a feeling that perhaps we deserve more from God, that he hasn't given us enough, that we're not content with what he has given us. Part of this is a blindness on our part, a blindness because of sin that really as we look at everything we have, everything we have is a blessing from God. Everything is really grace from God, God's undeserved love that he gives us because he doesn't have to give us any thing we fail to recognize how richly he has blessed each and every one of us part of this might come from a mentality as we may look at others and say well they have more than i have god is blessing them more than me why can't he bless me the same way he's not blessing me enough Social media and the TV and things today are really great. They kind of play on that, don't they? Where they say, well, you should want what this person has. To convince you that you don't have enough. Really, it's becoming jealous of that person. We can also have that attitude towards God that maybe we treat God as maybe a blessing vending machine, thinking we can go up and get blessings wherever we want, and he's going to. He has to give them to us, right? Right? Or we have that entitlement attitude. We may go around and say, of course God will do this thing for me. Why do I need to be thankful for him? He deserves to bless me. He needs to bless me in everything I do. Yet the truth is, is that God doesn't need to bless us, but we need to be thankful to God for the many reasons that he has blessed us. The countless blessings and grace that he's given to us. Because he didn't need to do that for you and me. He did not need to bless us because that phrase I read, I'll read it again, for the thoughts he forms in his heart are evil from his youth, still ring true today. That there's nothing in us that would require God to give us a blessing. No, he does it because he loves us. Romans 5.8 sums it up well. It says, but God shows his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Even though the state as we're born in this world and our sinful nature is evil all the time, God showed you and I grace. Even though Noah and his whole family, even though they were believers, they were sinful, God showed them grace even though he didn't have to do it. Grace is God's undeserved love. He showed Noah and his family grace and saved them Saved them physically, also spiritually, though, as that promise of a Savior came through them. And as you look back at that flood, you realize that their God has blessed you and saved you also. 
because he wanted to preserve Noah and his family so that promise of a Savior could come through so he could send his son Jesus to die on the cross for all your sins and pay for them, make you perfect in God's eyes. That promise of a rainbow that you see in the sky is not one that, that the, that it's not a, it shouldn't be turned into something that this world turns it into, but you should look at it and see God's grace and his love for you all the way back with Noah because he wanted to preserve Noah and his family so that you could be saved and go to heaven someday. God continues to strengthen our faith in him. He does this through his word. His word, as we study his word, as we want to dig deeply into his word, we realize that as we dig deeper into his word and he strengthens our faith, it opens our eyes to the blessings that are all around us. Those spiritual blessings that he's given us, but also those, those physical blessings that are all around us, where we real, realize that everything we have is from him and is a product of his undeserved love for us. You can see those physical blessings coming out in verse 21 and 22 where it says, I will never again curse the soil anymore because of man. Neither will I ever again strike every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, sea time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. Why does the sun rise in the morning? Why do we have seasons every single year, all four of them, fall, winter, spring, summer. You can have a scientific explanation for it, which, well, was just reflecting really the design that God has. The fact that this happens every day and every year, those seasons are because God is preserving this world, that he's continuing to bless us, that this promise he made there to Noah and his family is still ringing true today. It makes us realize that every day we have on this earth is truly a blessing from God. A blessing because if God wanted to pull back and end it, he could at any time, but he's holding true to this promise. Now there will be a time when this world ends, but it's not going to come from some doomsday scenario that we hear so often of maybe an asteroid coming and destroying all life on this earth or a nuclear holocaust that would destroy all life or even climate change that would make this world unlivable. No, none of that will, hap will happen. None of it will happen because we have this promise of God that it will not end until he decides it will end, and that would be sending his son in triumphant victory to bring us home to heaven with him. No, we can be confident that as we live every day of our lives here on this earth, he's sustaining this world, and he is blessing us richly through it. Blessing us physically with all these things that are around us and spiritually as he's given us his word as this is our time of grace here on this earth to come to faith and believe and trust in God as our Savior. We have so much to be thankful for. So what does Noah have to be thankful for? He had a whole lot. God saved him and his family. He did, God delivered him from the, all those sinful people that were there so that the Savior could come through his line, that he could be saved. And those same promises ring true to you and me also. God has blessed us. He's given us life, faith, forgiveness, salvation, and all our earthly blessings. He has poured his grace on us even when we did not deserve it. He's done all these things even though we were God's enemy. He came and made us his children. Because of this, through faith, we can't help but overflow with gratitude and thanksgiving to God, just as Noah did when he came off of the ark. Amen. Please rise. We continue with confessing our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may
may be seated. At this time, we'll collect our offerings of praise and thanksgiving to our Lord and Savior. As the offering baskets are passed, please place those attendance cards in the baskets. We love because Christ first loved us. We continue with the offering hymn, hymn number 577, Magnificent, Marvelous, Matchless Love. prayers this evening. We include a prayer of thanksgiving for Lynn Baker, who has uh, had a successful knee replacement surgery, and also for Harold. You, many of you may know him as Penny Dittman, who was hospitalized this week, and also for Darren Warnicke and Jenna Schmidt, who's, who will be married, I believe, this Friday, and Bob and B. Krieger's 62nd wedding anniversary, and Dale and Gloria Meyer's 53rd wedding anniversary, and Bob Herring, as he seems to be coming close to being called home to heaven. 
and also for the family of Ernest Omet, who was called home to heaven on October 6th. You may remain seated for prayer. Dear Father, you have blessed us greatly in this life, even though we are undeserving of it. Too often we are ungrateful for the many blessings and the grace that you have shown us. Help us better appreciate all your blessings all around us that we may overflow with gratitude towards you. Lord God, this week we will celebrate the love and commitment that will unite Jenna and Darren in a wonderful bond of marriage. May your generous blessing descend on Jenna and Darren. Grant them grace to live in their marriage according to your holy word. In thankfulness, first for your forgiveness and grace, and also for your gift of marriage. Strengthen them to be always faithful to each other and love one another as you love them. May their marriage be a beacon showing the world how your love is at work and motivates in the lives of your people. Dear Lord, the giver of the sacred gift of marriage, we thank you for the 62 years of marriage with which you have blessed Bob and B. Krieger, and the 53 years that you have blessed Dale and Gloria Meyer. Your love and grace have motivated these couples to love each other and remain faithful to their vows. Continue to bless them with commitment and love for you and each other. Help us, Lord, to always celebrate such occasions, for they are celebrations of your gifts and the power of your gospel. We give you thanks for the successful knee surgery that you granted Lynn Baker. Help her to continue to recover quickly. We also ask you to be with Penny Dittman, who was hospitalized this week. Help him to make a quick recovery and put his hope and trust in you. We also ask you to be with, to watch over Bob Herring and his family, as it seems the time is drawing near for him to, be, to go home to heaven with you. Keep his faith in the faith of his family centered on you. And Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for calling Ernest Omet home to heaven to be with you forever in paradise. Thank you for bringing him to faith in this life so that he may now have eternal life in heaven with you. Comfort the family with your grace, love, and promises that are found in your son's death and resurrection. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We continue with the next hymn, hymn number 626. My heart is filled with thankfulness.
please stand for prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for your teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And we join in the prayer our Lord and Savior taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated. We continue with the closing hymn, hymn number 507, Let All Things Now Living. Great to have you all in worship this evening. We have a, a number of announcements. Uh, tomorrow, between the services, we have coffee and donuts and those different Bible studies that we have going. The adult uh, Bible study across the street in the cafeteria. Down below, uh, we've got Sunday school and the youth Bible study in the council chambers. Excuse me, I lost my place. All are invited to the wedding and worship service of Darren Warnicky and Jenna Schmidt here at St. John's on Friday at 1.30 p.m. So this Friday, um, Darren and Jenna will be married here at St. John's. Uh, all are invited to the ceremony here. Rock weekend will be October 15th and 16th. There will be a door offering for the rock then. Matt Schultz will present. He's the um, um, one in charge of the rock at the end of the services and will be conducting a special Bible class next week. Sunday school is still in need of one teacher and two helpers. If you are interested in helping in any way, please let me know. The seminary chorus will be here at St. John's on October 30th during our Sunday services. We're looking forward to having that um, here, so mark your calendars for that. 
The gardening committee fall cleanup will be on October 29th and St. John's Ladies Night Out will be October 19th. There's more information in the bulletin. Christian Company will meet at noon on October 15th at the church to carpool to Lewis Station Winery. Crafty Ladies will be meeting October 12th from 11 to 12.30 in the lower level of church. Youth League is planning a lock-in October 28th and uh, through, well, the evening of October 28th through the morning of 29th in the school. Um, there's more bulletins in the bulletin there. New dates for VBS will be um, this coming June, not July 19th through the 23rd, so mark your calendars for that. Those are all the announcements we have for this evening. We also have a Wells Connection to view. The Lord bless your week. Hi, I'm Wells President Mark Schrader. Ministry to the young people of our synod is more important than ever. They're surrounded by a culture that's directly opposed to the beliefs and values they've learned since they were children. That presents them and those who minister to them with some real challenges. But no matter how difficult it may be, we know how vital it is to nurture the faith of a young person. One way that happens on a large scale is at the Wells International Youth Rally. As more than 2,000 young people gathered for worship, for instruction in God's Word, and, oh yeah, more than a little fun and fellowship. I think it's awesome so far. It's awesome. I really like it. That's two out of three. You got 30 seconds each round. Ready? There's certainly no shortage of excitement and enthusiasm at the Wells International Youth Rally, which returned this year to the University of Tennessee. I absolutely love it. I love how they have the bouncy houses because honestly it matches my personality. But it's not all just fun and games at this largest regular gathering of Wells members. This year, there were over 2,000 attendees. Coyne did a great job and then Pastor Westra, man, his message was powerful. We join together as God's children. We confess the Christian faith that lives in our hearts. I love, like, when we sing all together. It's so nice. I love it so much. I love just hearing everybody praising God together. When I think of the Wells Youth Rally, it's all these young people that are wondering who else is out there that believes the same things, and to look around this stadium and see their family in Jesus, and to be able to just make connections, whatever kind of connections they can make, they make, and just celebrate being Christians together, and celebrate having that true word of God and sharing that bond with each other. This four-day event gives teens the chance to be spiritually fed through worship and small group workshops and encouraged through the fellowship of gathering with so many others their age who share their faith. What I really appreciate about a teen event, having all of our teens be able to come from our congregations gather together because not every teen goes to a Christian high school. And just being a part of a community where they are surrounded by like-minded Christians. With this being a biennial event, however, there's a large gap of time between each youth rally. Four days of heightened, exciting spiritual nourishment and encouragement, and then everyone goes their separate ways. We don't just want it to be an experience at a cool place. We want to equip them. Uh, we want to equip those that are called and those that are willing to lead them and, and deal with them at such a critical time in their ministry. To assist local churches in encouraging the teens of their congregation between youth rallies, the Wells Commission on Discipleship is offering resources to help keep that fire going. The first is video-based materials that youth group leaders can use to plan this type of ministry. The other is a kit for putting on youth nights. Think of these youth nights as a youth rally experience that happens on the local level. 
The kit is a blueprint that local congregations can adapt and make their own to best fit their ministry setting. It is to, to bring about that, that sense of God's people getting together. It, it's not just necessarily kids from your own church. It's welcoming, it's inviting, it's getting kids from different areas and, and different places to maybe then sit down and to experience God's grace and to gather around his word uh, with other people that they might not often do. Adolescence is such a critical moment in the spiritual lives of Christians. These teens are coming of age at a time in history when Christianity is under attack, when following Christ doesn't seem to be what's trending. Whatever the different issues are that's facing them that my generation, you know, I don't even know. Uh, I, it's so new to me even, and, and I've seen a lot. Um, just to let them know you're not alone, and you're the here and now. Having so much fun and knowing that everybody like believes in the same stuff as me is so awesome. I cringe a little bit when I hear people say that the young people of our synod are the future. They are not just the future of our synod. They are the here and now of our synod. And I hope that they go back and say, hey, I am the now, get me plugged in. I want to be active, I want to be a part of church. I want to be a part of outreach. I want to be a part of building God's family and his community. We hope to see you at the next Wells International Youth Rally in 2024 at Colorado State University, where we'll be celebrating 50 years of equipping and encouraging our youth. In the meantime, resources for connecting with young people at your church can be found at wellscongregationalservices.net.